Well, good morning. Hope you guys have had a great weekend and a week. Um, we are uh, gathering in our homes and scattered all across the tri-state. And while we are not having corporate worship, we do want to worship with one another, uh, whether it be watch parties as gospel communities or friends or family that have uh, sat in living rooms or elsewhere to make much of Jesus Christ, to stir ourselves up by a reminder of who Jesus is and what He has done. And uh, we want to serve you in that with some singing, with some Bible teaching, with some prayers, with some Bible, Bible reading. My name's Josh, by the way. I'm one of the pastors, and we're glad that you've joined us with our online uh, content. If uh, you have questions about our church, uh, definitely feel free to reach out or comment on our YouTube feed now. Uh, my email is josh at redemptionchurch.me. I'd love to personally connect with you and talk about Jesus, the church, and uh, how we're, we're doing mission and ministry and service in these unique times. Uh, another component that I want to remind you of, if uh, you've forgotten, is uh, that, that this uh, different way of engaging is, is not even going to uh, we're not even trying to make like a normal corporate liturgy. That it's going to be informal, uh, it's going to be a little more laid back, but we hope every bit is meaningful and robust as, as you encounter God and, and His Word. And most of all, we want to make sure that the good news of Jesus Christ, His life, death, and resurrection for sinners is proclaimed, heard, received, enjoyed, experienced, and made known. And uh, one of the ways we've been doing that when we gather, and we're going to continue to do online, is our uh, New City Catechism, which is a question-answer sort of um, can be memorized and uh, can be uh, recited as a creed. And uh, our question today is, is question 45, and uh, look at how great uh, the articulation is that our salvation, our relationship with God is purely an act of, of God's sovereignty and grace. The question is, is baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? The answer, no. Only the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us from sin. So if you are, are coming to God today thinking, I'll please Him with Bible reading and singing and and uh, uh, prayer, um, that, that's, that's not at its root what a relationship with God is about. It's, it's receiving His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's pray to God in Christ's name as we center our hearts and our minds to encounter Jesus today. Father, You have uh, uh, scattered us yet again, and uh, people are in different places, encountering you in different ways and situations, different group sizes, some in their pajamas, some dressed, some on decks, some around tables, some perhaps in their car. And the good thing that, uh, good news about all of that is, is that you are looking for worshipers who worship you in truth and spirit, not necessarily in place. Or style. And so as we ride the wave of the Spirit in our day of this global pandemic, we ask that you would especially be close. We don't have the physical touch of our fellow believer, the audible sound of the people of God singing your praises. We're not tangibly holding the bread and the, and the wine in remembrance of Christ's body and blood, we, we're just missing some of those corporal, material ways in which you communicate to us and you serve us and you make yourself known through your people and your church. It's all the more needed that we, we have a felt, subjective, spiritual, invisible experience with the living God. So we, not that you need an invitation, but we do. We invite you into our living rooms, our bedrooms, this room at the church, into our very hearts, 
and say, you're welcome here. We, we want you to, to engage us, to rebuke, to encourage, to challenge, to comfort, to bring people to faith, to give us perseverance and continuance in the faith. So while Redemption, Redemption Church is scattered, the Holy Spirit is indwelling each one of us. And that's all possible because of the finished work of Jesus Christ in, who we pray, in whose name we pray.
Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of Jesus this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at that day of Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer writes about this verse. I need not torment myself with the fear that my faith may fail, as grace led me to faith in the first place. So grace will keep me believing to the end. Faith, both in its origin and continuance, is a gift of grace. Rock of ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior or I die. draw this fleeting breath when my eyes shall close in death when I soar to worlds unknown 
see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Lord Jesus, it is only by your grace that we can live. There is truly nothing that we can bring, that we can do, that we can claim, that we can accomplish, that we can be other than holy and completely covered by your grace. That is how we live. You are the reason we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. Open our hearts and minds to uh, the preached word and, uh, and make us more into, into your image, Lord Jesus. Amen. Turn in your copy of the scriptures with me to Psalm 32. I'm going to read the entire chapter, and there are three different times in which the Bible, uh, or the chapter says, Selah. So as I read and I come to the Selah, say that with me wherever you are. A mascal of David, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Say it with me. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the, great rush, or the, in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve trouble from me. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be cured, curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Of all the suffering and pain and destruction in the world, there is nothing more relentless and damaging and pervasive than sin. God's verdict in the scriptures is crystal clear that underneath everything that is wrong with the world, is plain old sin. It plays no favorites. It is in every single one of us. It refuses to leave. It knows no boundaries or limits. It is ugly and, and hateful. It simply satisfies its desires and then leaves us with the guilt and the shame. And even though we know all of that's true, we keep coming to it and serving it. We choose to live with it. And it makes us just feel crazy. In fact, sometimes it can make people literally go crazy. Um, a little while back, I came across a book by Chuck Colson called Who Speaks for God? And I can't remember what chapter it was, but it was a great chapter title. The Stink of Sin. 
And he tells a story of seeing years ago on Good Morning America an interview with a man named Albert Speer. I had not heard of him until I'd read in this chapter, but, but he was being interviewed by a man named David Hartman. And Albert Speer was a technological genius who kept the factories humming in Germany for Adolf Hitler in the World War II era. In any other time, he would have been an industrial icon, looked to as an example of how to be efficient and to keep a, a nation running. But because of that era and in that time and because of his values, he was complicit in the concentration camps and the gas chambers and how to do that well. And so when he was put on trial with 24 other criminals during the Nuremberg trials, he was the only one, however, that confessed his guilt and showed remorse. He did 20 years in prison, and afterward he got out and wrote a book, and it was during the press tour that he was on Good Morning America when Chuck Colson saw him. Hartman asked, you've said in your book that the guilt can never be forgiven and shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? With a terrible look of pathos and pain across his face, Spear responded, I've served a sentence of 20 years and I wish I could say that I am now a free man, that my conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment, but I can't bring myself to do that. I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime, and I can't get rid of it. This new book is a, a part of my atonement and attempt to clear my conscience. The interviewer pressed the point and said, You really don't think you'll be able to clear it totally? Spears shook his head and said, No, I, I don't think that's possible. That reminded me of another statement I'd read in another Colson book called Loving God in which during his ministry of prison fellowship in which he rehabilitates and shares the gospel and of Jesus with, with felons, goes into prisons, it's still a vibrant ministry today, was talking with a trained professional psychiatrist who expressed his frustration at not deeply at root level being able to help felons. He said, I can cure people's madness, but I can't cure their badness. I could turn a schizophrenic bank robber into a mentally healthy bank robber. A good teacher can turn an illiterate criminal into a well-educated criminal. My point in doing all of this is to, right at the front, make sure you do not miss the point of why this church exists, why we are doing online content, why Christians continue to share the gospel all over the nation and all over the world. That your only hope of getting the stink of sin off of your life, escaping the guilt and the shame that your wrong brings, and mine does too, the only hope of clearing our conscience and finding atonement is God's forgiveness. Don't turn this video off. Do not go about your day and forget that. The only way that you will be clean is God's forgiveness. When we come to Psalm 32, we are reading the words of a man whose badness is turning into madness. He, he is haunted all day by his stink of sin. He, he is up all night with regret and shame. Do you remember what his sin was? It's King David who wrote this. It tells us right there in the inscription. And the sin he is referring to here and the madness of the moment he was experiencing was from 2 Samuel 11. So hold your place in Psalm 32 and find 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I, I won't actually read 11, I'll read 12 or part of it. 
In 2 Samuel 11, King David is at the height of his success. He is popular, he is charismatic, he is powerful, he's loved, and it's made him soft in his prosperity, and he had begun to erode internally in a subtle, silent, secret way. And when the army was off to war, he went up on his roof to cool himself in his palace, which was obviously the highest building in the area, and he was able to look down to the surrounding homes. And in what we would say is ancient day boredom, channel surfing, looking at YouTube videos, he, he sees a naked woman bathing in her courtyard, which would not have been uncommon. As a way for, to do that, she didn't expect to be seen, was not trying to be. And in that moment of lust, he chooses to not necessarily force her, but perhaps implied, bring her into his palace with just a single night of, of just sex, just passion. Not love, this is not his wife. And before... The act was even carried out. He asked the servant, who is this that I see? And the servant, knowing what he's thinking, saying, that is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, David. But in that passion, he proceeds, sends her back into the night, and of all things, she becomes pregnant. And in order to cover the sin of his adultery with the wife of one of his mighty men, Uriah, he arranges for Uriah to be put into a place in the battle in which he will most certainly die and does. And then he takes Bathsheba into his harem of multiple wives in order to cover that up. And he continues to go through the public spectacle of of a godly king leading the nation not only physically but spiritually. While internally he is withdrawing into himself, he's isolating from his children and his family. He stops writing psalms during that period in his hypocrisy and just devolves deeper and deeper into decay spiritually as to his relationship with God. It wasn't too long before one day he gets a knock at his door. It would have been familiar. Uh, Very few people would have had intimate, direct access like that to David at this point. And the man's name is David. In verse 1 of chapter 12, 2 Samuel, the Lord sent Nathan, excuse me, his name was Nathan. The Lord sent Nathan to David. He's a prophet. Nathan was as close to David as anybody was. David named his third son Nathan. History tells us that Nathan was probably the tutor to David's children. And it it was not uncommon for Nathan to become aware of an injustice or a wrong that needed to be corrected and to bring that to David's attention so that he could get all of the, the leverage of government moving on it. And so he's showing up in one of those occasions to tell David a true story. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children, and it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And before the story's even over, David is through the roof. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan takes David by the elbows of his arms and looks him in the face and with tears in his eyes 
gives four monosyllabic words that get straight to David's heart. David, you are the man. David's response is fantastic. This is David at his best. You will find very few people in the Bible who repent as deeply and as fully and as quickly as David. No rationalization, no excuses, no spin. Verse 13, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. David, your, your sin's forgiven. You and the Lord, are, you're, you're, you're on fellowship terms again. You're clean. The stink of sin is removed. Your badness is forgiven. However, the consequences of your sin will remain and it will be in your house. And if you chart David's life, his life is one of constant ascendancy until 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And then it is one of decline, humanly speaking. And almost all of his pain and all of his sorrow is with his children. It's with his family. And I think that as soon as, as Nathan leaves... David, for the first time in many months, picks up his pen and begins to write psalms again. I think the first one is Psalm 51. You don't have to turn there, but I would read it today. It doesn't take you long. It's a song of repentance, confession, contrition. And he realizes he's got more to say. He's got more feelings to emote. And so I think as soon as Psalm 51 is, is written, he moves right in and starts to write Psalm 32. These aren't chronological. This, this is not a, a linear book. So 32 can actually uh, follow Psalm 51. Because Psalms aren't primarily sermons for me to preach. They're not treatises to be analyzed intellectually. They're poems intended to be sung and emotionally felt. And the Holy Spirit is writing lyrics into David's experience through David's personality coming through his pen and pouring onto the page so that it will be written on your soul and mine here today in 2020. The title is in the inscription, A Maskell of David. Now, we don't speak Hebrew, so maskell is a weird word. If you did know Hebrew, then you would recognize in the root there the verb sakal, which means to teach or to, to instruct. Some context, I think here, to give insight. To, to get the ability to see into a situation so that you know how to live. You know how to respond. You know how to emote. And as David is writing, if you can excuse a dumb country preacher's imagination, I think he is weeping as he writes Psalm 51 and Psalm 32. I think that's what these selahs are about. They're not there just to give us time to think and to pause and to reflect on what we've just read, although they do that. I think it gives David time to pull himself together. I think all of these selahs are, are written in tears. Every song, as you know, has stanzas. There's five of them. There's one in verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to title that The Joy of Forgiveness. The second stanza is verse 3 and 4, and I'm going to call that The, the Agony of Guilt and Shame. The third stanza is, is just a single verse, and that is The Relief of Confession. Verse 6 and 7 is a prayer for protection. Verses 8 through 11, pronouns shift, God speaking. It's I will instruct, I will counsel. God begins to talk. We'll call that the wisdom of instruction. 
All right, so look, look at the first stanza, and we'll be kind of pedantic. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Kind of sounds like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, doesn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the, the peacemakers. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, who, whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is, there is no deceit. And every time in Hebrew when you come across the word blessed, it means happy and it's always in the plural. It's blessed over and over and over again. Blessed continually. Blessed constantly. Just keep on being blessed. You're regularly happy. Not just once, but throughout your life. You're, you're happy when your transgression is forgiven as soon as you confess it and you begin to repent of it. And then a year later when the shame comes in and the accusations are there and the feelings of regret, it's covered. Oh, you're, you're blessed again. Constantly happy for all of these things. The first way he describes his sin is transgression. That means to break the law. A known law. Not just, a, it's, it's out there, but you know it. It's willful rebellion. I remember being a little boy and living next to Miss Atkins who had an immaculate lawn and I was seven years old and and I think it's stupid to, to go all the way around her house to just when I can cut through the yard to get to my buddy's house. And so over time, there would begin to be a little matted path from my running. I remember one time I went out and there was a sign. Mean old Miss Atkins put there. Keep off the grass. She could have just as easy. Josh, because I think the only one. So now... She always wanted me off the, off the lawn, but now I've got a choice. I, I, I just ran through the yard. Now, when I do that, I've transgressed. Sin was perhaps there in, before, but when I violate the known law, I've transgressed. Well, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Knowingly, do it anyway. Second is sin whose sin is covered, that means to fall short, to fail to live up to what you ought to be. Well, good news, blessed many times over is the one who fails to live up to who they're supposed to be. The third description is probably my favorite. It's the worst description of sin, although it sounds so clean and not. It seems the nicest. It sounds very biblical. Bible-ish. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. You know what literally iniquity is? A twisted act of perversion. I want you to think right now of the most twisted act of perversion you've ever committed or perhaps are committing and harboring now in an unconfessed, unrepentant way. You got it? What is it? Don't say it out loud. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no twisted act of perversion. I like that he, he calls it that. He doesn't say, blessed is the man who, who, whom the Lord doesn't count mistakes or slip-ups or errors or oopsies, faux pas. No, no, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts. No twisted, perverted acts. That, that's what our sin is. Finally, deceit. In whose spirit there is no deceit. I like that. It's not, a, a, a blessed is the man who, who God doesn't, or uh, who God forgives their lies, although that's true. It's blessed is the man in whom internally in your spirit there is not a deceitfulness. Because I think that's the root of our lying. Long before I lie to other people or I can begin to fake others out, I've had to self-deceive. It's easy for me to lie to you if I've convinced myself that I'm okay and I'm not doing anything wrong or it's, it's not that bad. 
But happy is the man who doesn't have to live like that anymore. Who could just live his life as an authentic open book saying, this is who I am. It's great. That's just the first stanza. In verse 3, he he pulls back the curtain and says, Now before all of this happiness was mine, let me tell you what it was like when I was for months living a lie. Hypocritical, secretive, harbored, unconfessed sin. No matter what life looked like for me on the outside, inside I was miserable. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. When? When he kept silent. You know what? Silence will not bring you relief or forgiveness. Acting as if your sin is not there or that it it isn't hurting you, that doesn't keep you from feeling like that. Why? Because for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. And we, we don't need anybody to tell us what that feels like, spiritually. We even had, yesterday, I, I was thinking about this, I knew Psalm 32 was coming, I have a physical a reminder of the spiritual reality of this in my house. I cut my grass a little too short and a couple weeks ago, and so my yard is dry and brown and brittle and barren. We had a graduation party for my son last night, and people were coming over, and it's a lot of folks, and so we were out on the deck, and we tried to set up fans, but it's like 98 degrees outside, and, and I'm just sitting on that deck and just sort of melting into the cushions. Strength is gone. It just like wipes you out the heat. That, that's spiritually what happens when we harbor our sin. We dry up. We become fragile and brittle. We lose motivation. Our attitude gets apathetic. We get lazy. He says, Selah, think about that. Some of you feeling this way right now? I I have no one in mind. Secret. You haven't told me. Perhaps nobody knows. But are you out of fear of being found out, or the scandal, or the consequences, or the effects, you're hiding it. You're you're not articulating that to God or to anybody else, and you're up all night. You're, You're losing strength and energy. You're even physically falling apart. Well, good news. Verse 5, look at the contrast. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. Now, you remember how David said it? You can use his words. If that was you, in verses 3 and 4 today, you can use David's words of 2 Samuel 11. I have sinned against the Lord. Say it. You don't say it out loud, but say say it to God right now. God, I've sinned against you. This is wrong. This is twisted, perverted, willful rebellion that has fallen short of who I am called to be. And I have lied to myself long enough. I have lied to you and others long enough. I have sinned against the Lord. And so I say I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And look at what God does. Every single time you face it, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. He forgives it. <laughs> Selah. I think that Selah is, is one of relief. The Selah after verse 4 is one of regret. It's one of brokenness. It's, it's one of tears. The one in 5 is relief. Now I've seen both. I, I've pastored long enough, 15 years now, and, and I'm, I've, I'll be the first to tell you that tears and contrition are not a replacement for repentance. But some of the best repentance happens with tears. I've sat in my living room. I've sat in my office. I've sat in in other people's living rooms and seen big, strong, masculine men 
sob. Not even able to get the words out as they unload oh, this sin they've been carrying around and rejoice in the, the beauty of God's forgiveness. Now verse 4, the tone shifts. It's no longer David speaking to his situation. He now talks to us. This is when the insight, the teaching, the masculine component of the, of the psalm comes to play. Through this experience that I've lived, I have a message. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. When's that? When you're miserable. God can be found at any point, but we're never more likely to do it when we're, than when we're like uh, living verses 3 and 4. If you are feeling that right now, that conviction, that churning, this, this silence is wasting me, I'm groaning, this feels heavy, I'm dried up. And here is this prophet, not me, but Psalm 32 with his finger in your chest saying, Come to him, now is the time. He may be found right now. The godly will, will offer a prayer. Offer that prayer. If you wait, then there are going to be competing voices. Either in your own mind or from the outside saying, No, 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 that sin's too bad. Albert Speer, it cannot be covered. You're too far gone. The consequences are too severe. That's the, that's the rush of great waters. The rush of great waters will come in and say, don't go to Him. It's useless. Not worth it. No, you come to Him because surely in the rush of great waters, they, they, they'll not reach Him. He doesn't listen to it. He will forgive every time, no matter who you are, and what you've done. And in verse 7, you are, I love this verse, you are a hiding place for me, you preserve me from trouble, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. Think about, let's stop. You know what I love about that, I think, the most? Is he doesn't say, God, you give me a hiding place. You, you will you'll provide a place for me to be preserved. You, you, will, you will send deliverance. No, he says, you are the hiding place. You are the, pers uh, the deliverance. You are the preservation. Isn't that great? You are. You. You. I remember being, this shows how old I am, but I remember watching college basketball games when a person fouls out and they're going to the bench, the student section would start saying, you, 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 all the way to the bench and sort of a taunt. David has been living with, you are the man, you are the man, you are the man, you are the man. And having received this forgiveness, he not, but you are a hiding place. You are a perseverance. You are deliverance. You, 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 the yous are all on God and who he is. And as he sort of collapses in relief and all the focus is on God, God says, give me the pen, let me write a few verses in verse 8 I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go I will counsel you with my eye upon you I love how that he's our teacher he's our counselor and I love how he is he, he does it with his eye on us I think there's two aspects of that one is is I will teach you and I will counsel you and you will never be outside of my sight there will never be a moment in which I cannot teach you or counsel you and know exactly where you are and what you're doing and what you need. The other component is, is the way that we receive that instruction and that counsel is by looking at His eyes. Some translations even say, I will counsel you with my eye. I did this in one of my pastoral encouragements a couple of months ago, this illustration, but when you have small children, they need counseled, with your eye regularly. Words are not sufficient. You will tell them to go get a glass in the kitchen. And they won't look. They'll just start looking for glasses and they're looking on this counter and they're looking, no, it's over left, right, 
over there behind the, the blender, wherever it's at. And they're not getting it. And so you'll say, stop, stop, stop. Look at me. It's right there. And they'll follow your eye. You've got to be focused on the Lord to receive this, this instruction, this counsel. It's God-given. And then the example is, Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, I don't know how much you know about horses and mules. I don't know much about horses. I know even less about mules. But I don't think we need to know a whole lot to get this. What's a wild horse? He's untamed. He's unbroken. He's out of control. He's wild. He's running recklessly without any intentionality, any benefit, any fruit. He's just running around. Be like a horse. Ignoring the wrong, ignoring the need to be tamed, to be controlled, to be managed, to be taught, to be counseled, to be forgiven. The other extreme is the mule. What do you think about with a mule? I don't have to say, we're all thinking of the exact same thing right now. We even have the phrase, you're stubborn as a mule. Whereas a horse is wild and unbroken, refusing to be tamed, a mule is rooted and entrenched and dug into his bad place and refused to be moved. There's both extremes and there's both ways in which this plays itself out. Sin's like that. It's, it's wild and uncontrolled and it's uncontrolled and it's stubborn. Charles Spurgeon said, There's the hair of the mule's tail in every single one of us. And then the psalm closes, Many with a, with a choice... Many are the sorrows of the wicked. You go that way, many are the sorrows. It, 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 the opposite is blessed. Many are the happinesses or the blessings. Well, that's, that's in this forgiveness. Many are the sorrows multiplied over and over and again are sorrows for those who remain in their wickedness. But, and this is what we need to do, steadfast love surrounds the one who atones for himself. No, trust in the Lord. In the progress of Revelation, in which many places David uh, prophesies, and Paul in Romans even quotes this psalm, his point is, is uh, summing up that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He has lived the perfect life without any transgression, without any sin, without any iniquity, and without any deceit. There was no deceit in His mouth. And He pays the penalty of our sin so that this forgiveness can be possible. That God doesn't just wink at sin, sweep it under the rug. He punishes it and He deals with it. The way that God can justly say, you're forgiven and not be unjust Himself, is to pay the punishment of our sin on the person of Christ. So therefore, we'll know only steadfast love. It will surround us and we receive that forgiveness. We receive that righteousness that Christ provides by trusting in the Lord. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. So choose gladness. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So that's the choice, and I'll end with three questions. I'll do these very quickly. First, am I speaking today to a horse or a mule? I can't tell by looking at people which one they are, and I can't see you today. But right now... Are you in your sin, unrepenting, unconfessed, continuing on, making light of it, hypocritically staying in that pursuit as if it's not hurting you and others and that others don't notice? You're just like a wild horse living under the false perception that you're free when internally you're enslaved to that sin. This is God saying to you, uh, you, you have no understanding, you need to be curbed with bit and bridle. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ and let God bring you close. Or are you a mule? You know exactly what you're doing, you know exactly that it's wrong, but for one reason or another you're, you're stubborn and you're going to stay in it. 
And God is saying, you need to leave this lifestyle, you need to leave this sin, you need to leave this danger, you need to leave this groaning, you need to get away from this stink, I want to clean you up, I want to forgive you, I want to take you in a new direction for purpose and, and effectiveness, and that requires you to move and walk with me. But you're <clears throat> stubborn as a mule. He'll forgive you, he'll teach you, he'll cancel you, but don't be like a horse or mule. Second, am I speaking to a David? You're so ashamed, you're so scared that if the truth were known, it would just be awful. You could not endure. You have just about talked yourself out of confession. There were times throughout this sermon that you thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray to the Lord. I'm going to even confess it to people who perhaps I've sinned against. But it's the rush of great rush of waters is just coming in so that you're, you've just about talked yourself out of it. There is no sin that you can commit that, that God will not forgive. There's, you, can, you cannot be so bad that He will not break, bring you in to His family and forgive your sin. There will never be a time in which a sinner comes to God and says, Have mercy on me, a sinner. And God say, You did what? Well, I, that's too much. He'll never do that. Or, how many times have, have you come to me Three strikes, you're out. This is the last time. You, you've, you've worn out your forgivenesses. Never. As many times and as long as it takes and as bad as it is, God forgives sinners. Happy many times over. Not just once, many times. Last question. Am I talking to a Nathan? Some of you are in the unenviable position of knowing a person in your life that you love and you're very close to, and they're the man, they're the woman. And with creativity and with tact and with tears and with your own self-repentance and your own humility and your own gentleness, you're going to go and, and with Psalm 32 in hand saying, it looks to me like you're, you're living in 3 and 4 here, and I want you to live verses 1 and 2 and 5. There's so much happiness. There's so much forgiveness. There's so much relief. There's so much release. There's so much joy. And I love you too much to let you continue on being a horse and a mule. Taking that risk to win back your brother or your sister. Some of you, this is the first time you've even come across this concept that forgiveness is free. We live in a day, our church is named Redemption Church, and we live in a day in which redemption happens by you doing enough good stuff or having good motives or good intentions that offsets the bad things you've done. That's man's way of justice and redemption. God's way of redemption is free gift, free to us. Jesus paid the penalty, but free to us. Right where you are, you say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I want my iniquity not counted against me. I want my sin atoned for, which is what covered means. I want to be forgiven. I'm believing Jesus has accomplished that for me through His death and resurrection. I'm receiving Him right now. That's trusting in the steadfast love of the Lord. If you've done that, let me know. I want to pray with you and walk with you in it. Let's pray. Father, what a great song. How gracious of us that we don't have to necessarily live out the experience of David to get great insight. It's often said that the best teacher is experience. Well, we do learn a lot through our, our failed experiences, but for me personally, the best teacher is learning from somebody else's experience. 
that I don't have to have the consequences and the sin in order to learn the lesson. And when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ, even that substitutionary, I didn't have to die on the cross in order to get the benefits. Teach us from your word how great is your grace. How great is your mercy. How great is our need. How great is our Savior. And for those who call on Him, how great is our future. Saved today, even through these YouTube videos where we're separated. But you're active in every life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, um, we're glad you joined us. We'll be doing this this week and the next two weeks. So August 2nd at least. So July 26th and August 2nd. And then stay tuned to when we, by God's grace, will be able to gather corporately again. Uh, if you'd like to uh, have questions about Jesus, about the gospel, about Psalm 32, about Redemption Church, please let us, let us know and we'll, we'll serve you well. I'm going to send you out with Romans 5 verses 20 and 21. I love this verse and talking about that, how we can't out God's grace. The law came in to increase the trespass. Meaning the law came to, to show us constantly how we're falling short. We were sinning without a law, but the law now is right in front of us. Miss Atkins is... Sign. It, look at all the ways you're failing. The law came in to increase the need, the trespass, the violation, the indictment. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Go into this week in His name, in His righteousness, and with His life.